Okay, everyone, last video about the shoulder region, this time the muscles of the shoulder joint. And yes, I'm wearing the same outfit for six lectures in a row because I'm in quarantine and I have nothing better to do but to film lectures for you all, and I'm happy to do it. Okay, so this video, we're gonna check out the muscle actions of the shoulder joint, and let's get right into it. All right, so we're back with the third video for the shoulder joint section. And in order to understand what these muscles do, we also have to recall what the shoulder girdle muscles do, as well as the synergistic movement between the shoulder girdle and the shoulder joint. Now first, to categorize them, we have the intrinsic muscles, as well as the extrinsic muscles. Um, intrinsic includes the deltoid, corticobrachialis, and teres major muscles. These originate on the scapula and clavicle, and we also have the rotator cuff group, which is subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. Now the larger extrinsic muscles are latissimus dorsi and pectoralis major. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about the deltoid muscle. Now the deltoid has three heads, the anterior, middle, and posterior head. And here we say fibers on this slide instead of head. But because of the arrangement of these fibers, it has differential effects on the shoulder joint. So the anterior fibers, right here in the front, anterior, we can, um, these fibers produce abduction, flexion, horizontal adduction, and internal rotation. So as I'm saying these actions, go ahead and try to do them yourself at home wherever you, or wherever you are. So abduction, away from the body, flexion, so shoulder flexion moving forward in the sagittal plane, horizontal adduction, and internal rotation. Now you might be wondering, well, how does it do abduction? If it's on the front and abduction is going this way, how does that line of pull work out? Well, it's because the posterior fibers also do abduction. And then everything else is just the opposite. So they both do abduction, but then instead of flexion, posterior fibers do extension. Instead of horizontal adduction, they do abduction. Hi, Jack. This is like literally in the middle of my video. Okay. I watched it. Now I have to edit this. I love you. Okay, instead of internal rotation, it does external rotation. Okay, so it has an opposite set of actions as the anterior fibers except for abduction because they contract together to do that along with the middle fibers. Okay, the pectoralis major. So because of this fan-like arrangement of the muscle fibers, we get many different actions by this single muscle. So the upper fibers will uh, contribute to internal rotation of the humerus, and just go ahead and do these with your own body and think about them as I'm talking about them. Um, internal rotation, we can imagine if these upper fibers are pulling this way, that that could internally rotate the humerus. They do horizontal adduction, so again, similar to a bench press or push-up. They do flexion, um, and then abduction. Now this is interesting, they can do abduction and adduction, but it depends on what range of motion we're talking about. So once the arm is abducted to 90 degrees, so let's say that this humerus is now up here. I'm trying to draw a humerus, not very well. It's up there. These fibers will be very stretched, but as it continues to go higher and higher than that, let's say up here, the fibers of the pecs will actually, can actually shorten to continue that abduction past 90 degrees. And then as far as adduction goes, at about 90 degrees, so maybe right here, if these fibers, which would be, I guess, stretched out to there, if they shorten, they're going to bring the humerus back down into adduction. Hopefully that drawing's not too messy for you. But just know that it depends on where in the range of motion the humerus is uh, on whether the upper fibers of the pec can do abduction or adduction. Now the lower fibers or the sternal head, so kind of from here on down, um, they can also do internal rotation and also horizontal adduction. 
So that's the same, but then they also will contribute to extension from a flexed position. So now if the arm is already flexed, if the shoulder joint is already flexed, now these lower fibers are stretched down here. And by um, contracting them, you're going to pull the arm back, the humerus back down into extension from that flexed position. And then these lower fibers also will um, cause adduction. So it's a little bit complicated, but if you think about the line of pull or the lines of pull of the pec major, uh, and then you think about where the humerus is moving and how that would stretch those lines of pull, then it can help you deduce all of these actions. Now latissimus dorsi is somewhat similar, although we don't have to think about the different fibers of it quite so much. We see this fan-like um, panation set up here. And <clears throat> it does adduction, right? So that seems obvious. If you abduct, then it would stretch those fibers out and then by contracting them and shortening them, it pulls you back down. Um, adduction and extension, those are the two kind of obvious ones of the latissimus dorsi. But then it also causes internal rotation and that's because it inserts on this interior or medial aspect of the humerus. And so by, by shortening, it will pull that medially and cause internal rotation. And it can also do horizontal abduction. So again, if you're already abducted and then maybe in, an, in a horizontally adducted position, so maybe let's say, just say you're flexed. <laughs> that's an easier way to say it. Your shoulder is flexed. Then we can um, horizontally abduct uh, you know, bringing the humerus posteriorly in that abducted position, and that will be caused by a shortening of the latissimus dorsi fibers as well. So basically, to strengthen this, easy way to remember it is to strengthen the lat muscle. Really, any type of pulling movement is going to work. So whether that's, you know, pulling vertically, or pulling, pulling horizontally, or even just pulling really close with your elbows in tight so that your shoulders uh, your shoulders are going through extension. Any of those are going to help to strengthen your lats. Terry's major is an interesting one. So it contributes to extension, but particularly from a flexed position uh, to the posteriorly extended position. So from, from a flexed position to hyperextension. It will also do internal rotation, just like the lats, because it is inserting on this medial aspect of the humerus. And then it can adduct the humerus, but particularly from an already abducted position down to the side and toward the midline of the body. Now then we have this little muscle called the coracobrachialis muscle. It doesn't get a lot of love. It doesn't get a lot of uh, thought usually when we're thinking about the musculature. It can cause shoulder flexion, pure shoulder flexion, as well as adduction. So we can imagine if this humerus was abducted, then it would lengthen these fibers to do so, and horizontal adduction as well. Now we get into the rotator cuff muscles. So an easy way to remember the rotator cuff muscles is to remember the acronym SITS for supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. And what I want you to visualize about the rotator cuff muscles is that they're essentially all just holding the humeral head into place on the glenoid fossa from different aspects. So the supraspinatus attaches to the greater tubercle from above. It kind of wraps over, uh, let's, so let's say you have a, you know, a left side shoulder. I think this is left to you watching. Um, a left side shoulder, here's the right one. Supraspinatus wraps over the humeral head. Infraspinatus attaches to the greater tubercle posteriorly and does external rotation. Teres minor attaches to the greater tubercle posteriorly as well and does external rotation. And subscapularis attaches to the tubercle anteriorly, so it does internal rotation. So you have one abductor, two external rotators, and one internal rotator. So these muscles are not very large but they must possess some level of strength and muscular endurance in order to keep holding the humeral head into place during, especially during repetitive and high velocity, high force movements. So this is why conducting repetitive overhead activities, especially with poor technique or fatigue or inadequate warmups or inadequate conditioning levels, these can lead to failure of the rotator cuff muscle group um, and it will just stop dynamically stabilizing the humeral head 
uh, because of fatigue or any of these other factors we've mentioned. Doing this can cause chronic or even sometimes just acute catastrophic damage to the rotator cuffs. So super important to take care of your rotator cuffs through some sort of strengthening, prehab type routine, um, especially if you tend to not be very, a very active individual and not use your upper, extremity, upper extremities in strength-based activities very often. It's a really good idea to make sure that you um, have proper technique with your movements and occasionally address the strength and um, um, endurance aspects of your shoulder joint. Okay, so here's the subscapularis muscle. And we see that it is an internal rotator. So now, right now, uh, we're looking at somebody from the anterior view. So this is actually the front of them. There's a couple of eyes. Okay, so there's our, there's our guy. We're looking at him from the anterior aspect because uh, you can see his sternum and his clavicles, etc. And if you look through his ribs, then this subscapularis is actually on that underside of his, um, of his scapula. And then it's going to wrap in front of the humeral head, and when it contracts, it pulls it into internal rotation. And then you can see the other actions that it does as well, adduction, extension, and stabilization of the humeral head. Supraspinatus is exactly where its name says it will be, above or superior to the scapular spine. You can see it's running behind there and coming over the top of the humerus. And when it contracts, it contributes to abduction and it stabilizes the humerus. Infraspinatus, or um, inferior to the spine, it contributes to external rotation, pulling on this greater tubercle into external rotation. It also does horizontal abduction and extension and stabilization. And finally, the teres minor muscle uh, below infraspinatus, again, the line of pull tells us that it will do external rotation along with horizontal abduction and extension and stabilization. So there you have it, the muscles of the shoulder joint. Again, this is just an intro to these muscles. The best way to learn them is to go out, palpate them on yourselves, feel these movements yourself, you know, maybe get an elastic band, do some external and internal rotations and feel where you feel that burn and you're going to be feeling it in your rotator cuff muscles. Palpate these on somebody else, ask them to contract and relax them, go through the joint movements and that will help you to ingrain the, um, the understanding of these muscles, not just conceptually, but also kinesthetically. Hey guys and gals, that was muscle actions of the shoulder joint. Now the next joint that we will be covering is the elbow. So if you wanna start learning about that, go ahead and head over to this video to check that out. If you have any comments or questions, go ahead and leave it down below in the comments for me and I would love to get back to you. As always, liking and subscribing to, to these videos helps me out a lot. It lets me know you are here and I'll see you guys over on that next video.